Good evening, everybody, and welcome to CDE Virtual. I'm going to ask Monkla Klachla, Chairman of Royal Buffer King Holdings, to kick us off this evening. Monkla, over to you. I hope you're there. Ah. I have managed to, yes, I've managed to find you in. Um, yes, Montla, over to program. you. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Anne. Uh, program director, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the virtual webinar series celebrating 25th year of existence of the CDE. It is to me a great honor and a privilege to open today's seminar on capitalism, COVID and the future of cities. Over the past 25 years, the CDE has consistently pushed the boundaries to seek space for independent thinking on issues that affect our economy, society and environment in South Africa. I'm very proud as a graduate of the UCLA School of Architecture and Planning that UN have been the strong, focused, consistent, and insisting leader behind this powerful independent think tank of our time. The CDE has become to us South Africans, a bridge to global debate, benchmarks, and independent thought. And I believe today we need such independent thinking and think tanks more than ever. It is therefore no surprise to me that yet again, the CDE, and on a timely topic, has pulled us together to reflect and envision what the future of our cities and settlements may look like beyond the integration or beyond COVID. In South Africa today, in South Africa, Today is exactly the 516th day since the country first locked down to contain the spread of the novel coronavirus pandemic. On the 26th of this month, it would have been exactly 17 months since the hard lockdown was announced. We have survived the scathing and painful isolation from each other and have become numb from seeing coffin after coffin and have numbed to the pain of seeing loved ones die and pass on. So what does this mean for the future of our settlements? Are we going to have to live in small groups of 50, having to think about speaking to one another via the cyber? I hope not. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, Montla. Uh, very important words. It's my great privilege and, and honor to welcome Ed Glazer back to South Africa, albeit this time only on Zoom. Professor Glazer is the newly appointed chairman of the economics department at Harvard University, and he's been called the godfather of modern urban economics. According to Larry Summers, for decades now, Ed has been the leading thinker about the economics of place and the economics of urban areas are increasingly being seen as central to broad economic concerns. One article I read about Ed described him as a city slicker, urbane and well-dressed. CDE has brought many of the world's leading experts to South Africa, but I've generally always met them before for inflicting them on the South African public. Ed was different and we managed to get him at the last minute to come to South Africa and I hadn't met him before. So the first time I met him, he stepped out of his hotel in Johannesburg, looking very American, khaki trousers, blue jacket, the bow tie, and clutching at least two cans of Coca-Cola. This was early in the morning, I should stress. I had a brief fleeting moment of trepidation 
wondering how he would go down and communicate with our complex and diverse society. But my fears were immediately allayed. Ed is a fantastic communicator to all kinds of audiences and has become a really good friend and a much valued advisor to CDE on all things urban and much more. So welcome Ed tonight. Thank you, Anne. Thank you for those kind words. It's wonderful to be with you here tonight. Great. I'm going to cover a number of areas tonight. Ed's view on capitalism, markets and states, his, his research on entrepreneurship and conclusions. Of course, his views on urbanization and cities. And then we will come to the impact that he thinks COVID has had and will have on the future of cities. So let's jump right in. Ed, you have said that the free market is far from perfect, but the track record of state dominated economies is far worse. In your view, socialism is a machine for empowering insiders, whereas capitalism was designed for outsiders. But today, many of capitalism's defenders often focus more on defending the status quo. Can you expand and explain these views to us? Thank you, uh, Anne. The, if we go back to the roots of capitalism, if we go back to Adam Smith and the wealth of nations, I, I want you, everyone to think about what it was replacing. So if you think about 1700, 1650, how is it that you got rich? Well, there were two tried and true ways, one of which was to suck up to the sovereign, Okay, that was a well-known way is to cozy up to the court and uh, you know, take advantage of your insider status. The second of which, of course, was to kill lots of other people and take their land, right? Those were, those were the two well-known ways. And in capitalism, in free markets, there's a vision of a third way in which anyone can come and become wealthy by providing products that actually bring pleasure to people or are useful to people. Instead of killing them, right, you're going to make goods that people want. and You're not going to require a royal license to sell them. You're not going to require a royal charter. And it's pushed by people uh, like the Scots of Adam Smith's day who are fundamentally outsiders, who don't have some great advantage, which is proximity to the crown. Um, and this is seen as being a way of breaking through for a straitjacket that, that harnesses talent and refuses to let it out. Now, the power of state-run enterprise doesn't disappear, right? Uh, even in the UK and Scotland in the 19th century, it's still not a complete liberal paradise, although it comes close. And certainly over the 19th century, it becomes clear that there are shortcomings of capitalism, right? Capitalism does not guarantee equality of outcomes, certainly. And it can often mean that people who start with less, their talents get missed. And so a rival school came up, which in some sense is a back to the future school, which said, let's let the state run it. Let's go back to state owned enterprise, right? And, and I wanna pose that as being a very different vision to a reformist view, which says, no, capitalism is basically healthy, but we wanna invest more in schools. We wanna make sure that we're doing more so that people who start with less can get further, right? That reformist view, I hardly endorse. But this other view that says, look, the system is basically broken. And unless we have the state own everything, we're not going to actually fix the problems. Now, we've had over 100 years of seeing what socialism brings us, and it is a return to the 18th century, to, you know, cronyism, not some new form of openness. I mean, I can't imagine a system that looked like it was more targeted towards insiders than the late Brezhnev uh, Soviet, the, the, the late Brezhnev Soviet system. There, there were a bunch of communist insiders who bought from uh, special stores, who enjoyed special privileges, and the ordinary people got very little. It was a less dynamic system. It was a less equitable system. Um, and it was a system that just showed that, you know, banning capitalism doesn't ban greed. Okay, it just ensures that the system is not transparent and open to outsiders. And I think what's really important as we go forward is to never lose sight of that original 18th century vision that, in fact, capitalism and free enterprise is meant to be a machine. It's the only really clear machine we have for enabling poor outsiders to become rich, prosperous people. 
And so we really need to protect it and to make sure that we're investing in ways that enable that machine to work and enable everyone to take part in it. And I know you've thought a lot about young people, particularly in America. What is the impact of the kind of capitalism you have in America today or the West on young people in particular and jobs? So I have a view that, you know, so I want to take, take us back 40 years ago to Manker Olson, who wrote The Rise and Decline of Nations, which um, very much tells a story that in stable societies, cliques of insiders will gradually achieve control over regulations and over the powers of the state and will make sure that all of the benefits of society flow to them. Olson was very much talking about England in the 1970s when you had both the trade unions on the left who had managed to gain control of, of uh, the state, but also various older guilds, the, the various entrenched financiers, the old nobility, a whole bunch of insiders who were also empowered. He also talked about, for example, uh, Tokugawa Japan as being another case in which sort of old standing guilds had taken over. Well, I read this book in 1983, uh, written in 1983, I read it in the late 1990s. I said, this isn't America. America is full of openness. And you know, if you just don't like your city, go to some other city. There's always something new going on. You know, 30 years later, I think Olson was right because I've seen over and over again in sector after sector, insiders managing to reduce opportunity for outsiders in a way that would have been quite familiar to the Royal Court of 1730 in England, right? So we have occupational licensing in lots of areas in which you don't need an I, occupational license to be an interior decorator. Uh, you don't need an occupational license to be a florist. These are simply tools for making sure that outsiders don't come in, that you can't cross state boundaries, that you can't uh, you know, change occupations. America has severely curtailed its ability to build new housing through a whole set of regulations which are allegedly motivated by either environmental concerns or uh, historic preservation concerns. And so housing has become much less available, much more expensive, and really something that young people no longer feel that they can aspire to own a home, at least not in the more expensive parts uh, of America. You know, our national government has been described not unfairly as a pension system with an army, right? Because it is so targeted towards providing stuff for the old and empowered relative to, to providing things for the young. And it is the young and the disadvantaged to pay the price. You know, an extreme example of this occurred during COVID when the California's teachers union declared that in a fairly obscure California law meant that teachers not only could not be compelled to teach live, perhaps a reasonable thing, but they couldn't be compelled to, to Zoom either, right? That there was nothing that, that in fact, you know, and, and this was a complete attempt to defend their insiders against the kids who were losing out. So I think many young Americans look at the system and say, look, if this is capitalism, I don't want it, right? And what they're missing is what they're asking for instead is, you know, free uh, forgiveness of their, of their student loans, various other personal benefits that go for them that really, you know, look at the world as a zero sum game. And what they should recognize is that this isn't capitalism, this is cronyism, right? This is something that has come up at, to, you know, pull capitalism back. And really what we all should be fighting for is a capitalism that's freer, uh, that a capitalism that is meant for outsiders, uh, for a capitalism that anyone can get started of whatever color, of whatever education, of whatever income. Let's move from that very interesting perspective to entrepreneurship. Um, you have done a lot of research on entrepreneurs and looked at small businesses. And you've, you've said in response to the devastation of lockdowns on, under COVID-19, I was intrigued by two things you said. First is you said, the state should not throw money at every business, but needs to focus on how to enable new firms to open and replace, replace those that have shut down. And secondly, you've said that states make very bad venture capitalists. Why don't you talk to us about those two rather broad <laughs> conclusions? <laughs> well, the, you know, I, I was sort of, uh, uh, perhaps I'm just old school. You know, there was a time when I thought a trillion dollars was like real money. Uh, but apparently now we just view it as being, you know, a normal part of of uh, expenses. Um, the, the largesse involved in the Paycheck Protection Program, which is heading towards $2 trillion uh, now, uh, was just doling out money to American businesses hit by COVID. And it's interesting that it was sort of universally supported 
by our legislators. I mean, it was really sort of no holding back. I certainly agree that COVID was an extraordinary shock to the system, particularly to small businesses, which had a very thin sliver of a financial um, safety net on which to, to, to hand to, to, to rest. But the level of money spent was just extraordinary. And it sets a very bad pattern because basically, you know, you can't just keep on printing money to fund every failing business. And you shouldn't, the federal government is not very good at figuring out which businesses are likely to be successful or to bring value and which ones aren't. I mean, it's very hard to be a venture capitalist. Most venture capitalists aren't good venture capitalists. I mean, it's, and no part of being elected to Congress or to a governorship suggests that you naturally would be the kind of, of uh, person with the skills to pick out which businesses uh, would succeed. Moreover, once you're in power, everything pushes towards politics rather than to good economics, right? Everything pushes to favoring the business that will deliver more votes for you or the business of the person who is likely to contribute to your reelection campaign. So just the whole you know, mess of having the government be engaged in picking winners and losers, whether or not at the firm level or at the industry level or at the place level, it's a mistake, right? The government should try and create a strong playing field, one in which individual participants start with the skills that they need to succeed and then by and large, let the system run. Let businesses fail or succeed, right? Ensure that the basic structure of capitalism, the basic legal environment to allow those successes and failures works. But you really don't want to try and micromanage the enterprise. You know, Adam Smith talked about this 240 years ago, and we now have 240 years of evidence since him that state-managed you know, capitalism is, is really a, a terrible mistake. So, you know, whatever we think we want governments to do to care for poor people, let's do that. Let's make sure we have whatever form of a social safety net for the poor that we think we can afford. And by all means, let's make sure that we're making the investments we need to in the skills that people need to succeed. But let's not think that we need to protect every business from going under. Let's worry instead about, you know, the businesses that haven't yet been created. And let's make sure there aren't barriers to their uh, success. You know, I want to make one point particularly about the U.S. and the barriers to new businesses, um, which is that one of the more outrageous things in the U.S. is that we regulate the entrepreneurship of the poor uh, so much more heavily than we regulate the entrepreneurship of the rich. And this is partially because rich entrepreneurs tend to, tend to be entrepreneurs in cyberspace, maybe because cyberspace is so right, lightly regulated. But if you want to start your internet phenomenon in your Harvard College dormitory room, there are basically no regulators looking over your shoulder until you have you know, a billion users and it possibly hacked an election. But if you want to start your bodega, your grocery store in uh, you know, five blocks away and sell milk products, you need 15 licenses to get through. The inequity of this is just awful. And it really is important post COVID that we make it easy for small businesses to start again with things like one-stop permanent and maybe a you know, top to bottom uh, cost benefit analysis of the existing regulations that we have that restrict small businesses, particularly small businesses that are operated by the poor. Hmm. Yes. Let's move to urbanization. Um, there are many people in South Africa and in other developing countries who are fearful about growing urbanization and they see these rapidly expanding cities and worry about this. Most of them would prefer that everyone else, not themselves, uh, stay in the rural areas. Now you said that for, develop, for the developing world, urbanization is the best path to prosperity. Why are you so positive about urbanization in the developing world? What, what's your evidence and what's your thinking on this? Well, uh, uh, to start with the evidence, right, we have, three or four different types of evidence suggesting the, the tremendous benefits that come with urbanization. We have at a very broad macro level, we have the, the positive correlation between uh, urbanization, say in 1960, and income growth over the next 50 years. So those countries that started with an, an edge in urbanization, particularly those in East Asia, did phenomenally well, whereas those countries that started with very little urbanization uh, did far less well. We also, of course, have the very strong just cross-sectional correlation between urbanization and uh, incomes. Um, if you compare those countries that are more than 50% urbanized to those countries that are less than 50% urbanized, the more urbanized countries have incomes that are five times higher on average and infant mortality levels that are less than a third. We also have robust evidence linking um, incomes and the levels of urban density or urban agglomeration within countries. Um, so, and this is not just 
that you know different people live in cities, but when you see people come to cities, you see their wages go up. Not immediately, but month after month, year after year, because cities are really forges of human capital, places where we become smart by being around other smart people. And you know, when poor people come to cities, it takes them a while to figure out what works, but eventually you know, the track record is really pretty good. Um, third, we have evidence on non-economic outcomes, including, for example, infant mortality, malnutrition. Um, all of these suggest that the people who come to cities aren't uh, being in any sense foolish. And finally, I would be remiss not to measure just the sheer life satisfaction or happiness data. So in the wealthy world, there's really no correlation between living in a big city and being particularly happy. But in the poor world, there really is. In the developing world, there really is. And in countries like India and South Africa, people who live in cities typically say that they're happier. And it's not that living in a township or in an Indian slum is some, you know, cakewalk, obviously it is not, but you have to compare it with the alternative, which is not, you know, your own life of, of relative prosperity, it's whatever life was available, and there's really not much future in rural poverty. Now, when I think about the, the downsides of density, and of course there are significant demons that come with density, um, most awfully contagious disease, but also traffic congestion, high housing costs, and crime, um, these are things that should lead us to redouble our efforts to make cities humane, not give up on urbanization. Um, most of these things can be fought with more effective government. And that's why you know, the other part of, of CDE is so important, that it's not just about empowering enterprise, it's empowering the government that's needed to make you know, countries and cities uh, livable. And countries typically get better when they work on, on urbanization. So, in my new book, the book that's coming out, one of the stories that I tell is the 19th century fight against urban plagues. So cholera and yellow fever were these terrible things. And cities responded actually not out of medical knowledge, but out of medical ignorance. In fact, they, were, they got the medicine wrong, they got the, the, and that caused them to do the right thing for public health. It's an odd story, but in fact, you know, there were two great theories about cholera or yellow fever. One emphasized contagion, which turned out to be right, um, and the other which emphasized miasma or foul airs or foul waters. Now, the contagionists thought that the right thing to do was to have quarantines, but we really were never very effective at imposing quarantines. The miasma theorists said, drain the swamp, get rid of the fetid water, right? Move the aqueducts in, right? Put in sewers. And, you know, they had no idea about how cholera was actually being spread by water throughout most of this time period. But it turned out they got through pure dumb luck, they got the public health exactly right. And this fight to create clean water and create sewers in the 19th century, which was an incredible fight. I mean, America's cities and towns were spending as much on clean water and sewers in 1900 as our national government was spending on everything except for the post office and the army. But this push, which was a collective enterprise, where the leaders of these cities, private sector and public sector, came together to make these huge investments. This was the moment, I think, in the modern world in which governments stopped being largely instruments of death and started being instruments of life. And it is this evolution which came from cities and came from the fight to deal with the downsides of density that offers the promise that by continuing to engage with urbanization, the governments of the developing world can get massively better. So I think there's just a lot of upside in urbanization in the developing world. And you know, even though we are in the midst of a pandemic, this pandemic is not actually all that urban, right? So cholera, you sort of can escape if you move to your own system that's not connected to the water. Airborne pandemics, whether the influenza pandemic of 1918, 1919, or COVID-19, uh, right? These airborne pandemics really get everywhere. Right? They really are not, it's not like moving to low density areas are necessarily a, a safe haven for this. So I think while we should redouble our efforts to make sure that cities are as healthy as they can be, I don't think this pandemic is actually something that we should think is going to stop urbanization, particularly in the developing world. That's really interesting. We're going to come back to some of that a bit later on, but let me dig deeper on cities. You, you've said that cities are places where miracles can happen. How do cities actually encourage innovation and make their inhabitants more efficient? Why is density such a positive force? Uh, I've always liked the statement that you've made that, that cities are responsible for humanity's greatest hits. So maybe you can take your time to talk us through all of that. So the starting point is just cities are about connecting us, right? Cities are the absence of physical space between people and between firms. And uh, they enable us to work together, to cooperate, sometimes to compete, 
and of course to learn from one another. And so the most visible example of that somewhat outrageous claim of, of cities being responsible for humanity's greatest hits um, occurs in things like the arts and science, where you can really trace the movement of an idea. So for example, fifth century Athens, right? I mean, the connection that runs from, you know, Socrates to Plato to Aristotle is just really clear. And these are people who knew each other, who are connected physically with one another, who learned from one another. Or similarly, you know, in 15th century Florence, the, the Renaissance, particularly in painting, right, starts with Brunelleschi and he figures out the basic mathematics of linear perspective, how to make two-dimensional paintings seem three-dimensional. He passes it along to his traveling companion and friend, uh, Brunelleschi, who puts it into a low relief sculpture on the walls of a church in, in Florence. They then pass it along to Masaccio, who then puts it into painting, for example, in the Brancacci Chapel. And then it just moves on, right, to Fra Filippo Lippi, who is a, a student of, of uh, Masaccio's and a friend, right, Lippi's student, Botticelli, and so forth, each person learning from each other, riffing on each other's ideas. And this is how creativity works. We could tell a similar story about what happens in Silicon Valley in the 1960s and 1970s, where a group of entrepreneurs who know each other quite well come together in places like Walker's Wagon Wheel and, you know, borrow ideas and compete with one another. This is how creativity works, right? None of us, very few ideas, uh, none that I know of, in fact, that really impact our solo inventions. In some sense, our greatest talent is our species, is our ability to be intellectual magpies, to borrow ideas from people around us and to then use them and to riff on them, right? This is what cities enable, but it's more than that, right? Cities are also places where poor people can come and work together with rich people, right? Uh, someone who's got labor can find someone who's got capital and can get themselves started on uh, the path towards something amazing. It's a place in which the competition between firms can be incredibly helpful, right? In terms of figuring out quickly what works, constantly having incentives to, to try new things. And you know, you feel it in, in cities like Johannesburg, quite honestly, as well. That you know, for all the difficulties, I mean, South Africa has amazing, amazing people and amazing entrepreneurs as well. And you just, you know, the, the energy that comes from human beings who both, you know, benefit from proximity to each other because of the ability to learn, but also benefit from the ability to compete with one another. It's just one of the greatest things that humanity has ever had. I mean, in some sense, it's just, you know, this larger theme, which is on our own, very few human beings are able to take on a bear, right? I mean, we're not all that empowered as a species on our own, but collectively, we've done some pretty amazing stuff. And cities are engines for enabling us to collaborate, enabling us to cooperate, enabling us to learn from one another. Ed, let's dig deeper about cities and the poor. Um, you've said that cities are ladders for individuals and for society as a whole, and that cities can lead the battle for economic opportunity. And in a country like South Africa or other developing countries, that's such a critical perspective. How do you see cities and the poor? So I think there are two different ways in which uh, Surely more, but two, two that I want to highlight uh, of ways in which cities interact, particularly with the fight to get out of poverty. Um, and this is even beyond the general tendency of cities to, to you know, be an economic engine as a whole. So perhaps that's the most important level is just cities are part of the development process. But when you think of particularly aiding the poor, um, one way is through the delivery of public services, especially education. Right, that in fact, getting good teachers to go to far flung rural areas is incredibly hard. We have just a lot of evidence, particularly from the Indian context, where the literature on teacher absences have been particularly strong. You know, they just don't show up. And it's just much easier to get teachers to be in, a, uh, in an urban environment. You know, your own work, I think, in terms of or the work of CDE on private education in South Africa, I think shows this as well, that it's not just the state delivering education, it's the private sector delivering education. It's the ability of a dense urban market to facilitate this sort of highly competitive, you know, world in which we have schools popping up, delivering skills to ordinary people who just want to find a way to get ahead, that's much easier to do in a large, dense city than it is in a far-flung area. On top of that, of course, 
there's just the skills that are in the air. You know, Alfred Marshall, when he was writing about the benefits of clusters in uh, more than 120 years ago, wrote that in, you know, in these clusters, the mysteries of the trade become no mystery, but are, as it were, in the air. And it is just far more plausible for kids growing up in Johannesburg to have some idea about how business works than it is for a kid growing up in the rural hinterland somewhere, just because it's all around them. So this is one important way in which cities uh, relate to poverty. The second way, I think, which is also incredibly important, is cities as places of entrepreneurship and opportunity for the poor when they grow up. So um, the, one of the really fascinating thing about things about cities, of course, is they're not just places in which you can find a job working for someone else. It's that you can start your own business. And there are just many more opportunities for that, that to happen in cities. And I mean, the, the, there is a question, there's a debate in, in development economics about whether or not this kind of ground level entrepreneurship can actually be an engine for economic growth at the national level. But leaving aside from that, right, the, the number of people who have found their own way out of poverty by you know, starting with a shop, starting with doing some kind of small enterprise, that runs in the millions by this point in time. So the, the ability of cities to enable the natural entrepreneurship of all human beings right, to thrive and to find opportunity is really exceptional. I mean, you know, when you walk around, um, you know, uh, take, a, take a slum like Dharavi in, in, uh, in, in Mumbai, in India, right, it just amazes you all the ways that people have found to earn a dollar, right? They're recycling boxes, which means they take the old boxes, chop them up and turn them inside out so you can't see the old labels. They are, you know, making these little pot products and they're so proud of them, they won't even take them, take any money from you for them. They are, you know, sewing undergarments, just like in the Lower East Side of Manhattan in, in 1905. There's just an amazing panoply of, of opportunities that they found. And you wonder, how did they figure out that there was, a, there was a way to make money in this? And the answer is the city tells them. The city's the conduit for knowledge, not just at this very high level, how to make a three-dimensional painting, but also at the very low level. Look, there's money in recycling copper, right? So this, this knowledge combined with you know, the natural human energy makes cities incredibly important places where poor people can find opportunity. Hmm. I want to talk more about developing country cities and ask you to talk about women in Zambia. I know you've done or you've supervised some research there, which I think will be interesting. And just to illustrate your point, I was in Delhi once standing outside the old city and suddenly realized that there was a little business going on in front of me. And what was it? Slightly richer people were exchanging their old used rupees for newer rupees. And the man was making a slight margin on that. And so it's one example of what you're talking about. But perhaps I thought your Zambian story was really interesting and that people would be interested in that. Sure. So um, this is joint work with Nava Ashraf and Alexia Delfino. Um, and uh, they mostly put together this really almost entirely um, the complete census of manufacturing entrepreneurs in Zambia. And there's a lighter uh, census of other entrepreneurs in other areas. Um, and we've also worked on the World Bank Enterprise Survey, which enables us to look at entrepreneurs throughout the world. Um, and there are, are two facts that come out or three facts that come out about female entrepreneurship, both in Zambia and, and globally, which is one, uh, you know, the share of entrepreneurs who are women is often very, very low. They typically earn less than men. And they are typically segregated in a small number of clusters, particularly uh, clothing and food production, traditional clusters where they can work with other women. So what's going on here? So mostly because of, of ethnographic work that uh, Nava and Alexia were able to do, right? One of the things that comes out very clearly from what these women say is they feel like they cannot trust men, either as customers or as suppliers or as partners. And when you think about you know, cities as places which are supposed to be about cooperation and connection, if you feel like you know, the majority of people who are in business are untrustworthy, it becomes very difficult to take advantage of that, right? And so they end up segregating in a small number of industries because they can work with other women. And the untrustworthiness of men both has to do with you know, uh, sexual advances or um, you know, stealing their stuff or stealing their business or you know, not, doing the not doing the work. Um, the, and you know, there's a thinly veiled threat of violence, which is often there in the background. Uh, and Zambia is a little bit different from the um, Arab nations, 
which typically have the lowest levels of female entrepreneurship, in which this is just a very hard social stigma against women leaving the home. And that, that's not really a, a thing in Zambia as much, although Zambia certainly is a, a sexist society by most measures. Um, the, um, we did a bunch of experiments around trying to give women more rule of law in different ways. We also were able to look at women working inside and outside of these markets. Markets were protected by a chief. The chief was either elected or appointed, and the chief had the ability to discipline people who misbehaved. Women were much more success inside those markets, and typically the gap between women and men disappeared, particularly in markets that were um, had a preponderance of other women within them. Uh, and when we engaged in these um, lab in the field experiments where we sort of randomly gave people better rule of law, women really benefited from that and really valued it. And it reminds you that you know, rule of law is actually critical for cities, and it's particularly critical for the weak, not for the strong. Right? There's a tendency to see you know, rule of law and, and you know, courts as being ones that are hijacked by the powerful. Well, the powerful hijack every institution, okay? and we have to fight against their, their hijacking the institution. But it, the absence of rule of law is dead in tooth and and it's one in which the male proclivity to violence, which has shown up in every culture that I know of for thousands of years, really tends to mean that, that women tend to lose from that. And they end up retreating from entrepreneurship, retreating into particular, uh, particular sectors, which can work primarily with other women, and they end up earning less. And I really think that this is one area in which you know, cities have a lot of work, both in the US and elsewhere, to ensure that one half of the population is able to use their entrepreneurial talent, which is absolutely as creative as anything that men have. And, you know, we, I'm, I'm at this point in time talking to one of the world's great policy entrepreneurs, so I, I know of what I speak, um, but it's held back by sort of the, the limits on, on rule of law and the inability to trust the other half of the population. Let's turn now to city government, um, and I want to spend quite a lot of time here. Let's start with your views on city government in general, and what, what the core functions of a city government are or is. You've talked a little bit about water and so on, but it's sort of based on your historical readings and your, your perspective on this, start with this in general, the role of a city government. So. Um... The things that are there, there are things which are common to all governments, which are something about rule of law being being uh, functional and doing something to provide um, opportunity for the poor, meaning education. Right, those things I think of as being fairly fairly central to all governments, and they're not particular to urban governments. Um, urban governments have a particular function which goes beyond national governments or or rural governments, which is to deal with the downsides of density. That. Um, in a sense, abundance of land hides many sins. And if you are living in a low density area, you know, the fact that you can't deal with your waste very well sort of becomes irrelevant. The fact that you don't have a good way of dealing with traffic congestion becomes irrelevant. Uh, and you can always run away if there's a crime problem. So even crime becomes less problematic, although that's, that's less clear. In an urban area, you know, every person's waste is everyone else's problem. And so dealing with sanitation is a major deal. You have a shortage of road space. And so dealing with congestion is a major deal. You have a shortage of living space. So you know, figuring out what rules you have around the built environment are a major deal. Um, and of course, crime and contagious disease are things which can be multiplied in cities and increase the challenges facing governments. So even though cities offer more opportunity, they also have more challenges and they require more government. You know, I often have a line, which is in the US, urbanites are much more pro-government. They tend to be much more left-wing within the US context than, than rural dwellers. And, you know, I explain by just saying, you know, people in cities actually like government more than people who don't live in cities because they need government more. And that's that's just a basic fact uh, about uh, life. So it doesn't mean that you want, you know, city governments to do things they shouldn't be doing, like artificially regulating entrepreneurship or, you know, imposing limitations on, on uh, occupations. But you do want a city government that is robust enough to fight against, uh, you know, fight against uh, ways to fight against crime, to fight against traffic congestion. So these are these basic functions. Now, the second fact, which is really critical about city government, and it's probably true of most of the government, is the capacity is more important than policy. 
right? This is something I've learned the hard way that in fact, for most of us who sit in, in our ivory towers, we tend to think if we just come up with a clever policy idea, that's it, boom, that's, we're gonna implement it. That bears no resemblance to actually city government anywhere in the world, right? The question is, is there leadership that is actually empowered to make changes? Do they have personnel who are able to implement changes? Do they have you know, the ability to wave, to deal with whatever political blowback you're gonna have? And very rarely do city governments have that much ability to actually make changes. So you know, one of the first things to think about is where does capacity come from? One of the things that uh, and I, you know, I've talked about in the past is the extent to which the private sector can augment public capacity. And there's a very interesting model, which is the Columbus Partnership, which is a series of, of business leaders in Columbus, Ohio, who have basically come around to create a shadow government for the public sector that actually provides it with you know, support when it needs it. Now, Columbus Partnership isn't in charge, the mayor's in charge, but they're there when the mayor needs them because they recognize that everyone benefits when the city government gets stronger. I continue to think that's a nice model for Johannesburg, which has such a robust private sector and has the, that public private sector has the capacity to really deliver um, extra capacity for the public sector. But it's, it's you know, this, this fundamental truth is, is really there. Um, the third fact, which is, I think, central and difficult, is that almost always when dealing with the downsides of density, infrastructure is not enough, right? So if you build more roads, um, people will drive more. If you build a water main, but don't actually supply the connection to everyone's home, you'll have a last mile problem where people don't connect to the water main. This is true in 21st century Africa. It was true in 19th century New York. And it was not until you had the Metropolitan Board of Health, which started imposing fines on oh, property owners who didn't connect to the water that you actually solved that last mile problem. Now, as that example just illustrates, incentives often mean fines and fines are never popular. OK, so the problem is getting to something that actually deals with the downsides of density in some way other than just spending federal money, spending, spending public money can be politically fraught. And so that's one of the challenges for city leaders is do they have enough you know, ability to does the public trust them enough that they will actually accept that some people will actually pay a price for the greater good. Some people will pay some sort of reasonable cost so that this road will not be completely congested so that you know we won't be breeding antibiotic resistant disease going forward and so that's the third challenge is figuring out how to deal with the incentives problem as well as the um, as well as the infrastructure problem if there's a fourth challenge it is you know when you're dealing with these infrastructure challenges um, there's the question of what institutions actually work and this is often not about city government, but it's about national government. Who should build your water your waterworks? Who should maintain your waterworks? Should it be a purely private company? Um, if that private private company is going to be subsidized by the public sector, well, private companies are good at cutting costs. They're also really good at bribing the government and figuring out how to make sure that public subsidies go their way. So you know, use them, but don't be don't be convinced that they're they're a perfect provision for everything. What about parastatal enterprises that are you know public but independent of local government? Well, sometimes those things can be free of public corruption, and if you can get a really visible, high quality manager to lead them it may tend out tend to be all right but another you know form of these independent public entities are parastatals and we know that in many countries parastatals have been you know public you know without the accountability so it's been even worse than having public direct provision um, there is public direct provision that is a, that is an option of course and then you know for some services nonprofits work now in 18th century england there were even turnpike trusts which were nonprofit road operators it's hard to imagine that in the 21st century but certainly there are some public health functions that can be done through nonprofits so you need to think about what institutions work correctly for for you and i think the answer from urban history is that there is no one answer it's not like private provision is always right or wrong it's not like having a Parastatal is always right or wrong. It's you need to understand what institutions fit well with the local context. Great. Um, Ed, when you were in South Africa in 2018, you and I walked around the noon in Cape Town and we threw the Johannesburg in the city. And you talked about the two essential core functions of cities, city governments. Um, property developers and helping the poor out of poverty. And I want you to talk a bit more about this because if you remember the city councillors or the city officials in Cape Town asked you a question about this and this was your reply. And I thought it was really 
a helpful way of thinking about South Africa's cities in general. So uh, thank you, Anne. And so, so um, it's uh, uh, the reason why I pushed this idea was you often get into a whole jumble, right? Should you be taking like affordable, should you be taking high-end housing units, let's say on the, you know, with waterfront access and giving them to poor people in Cape Town? Uh, should you be using a variety of, you know, things that are about, you know, uh, rich people and should you be making them available to poor people? And what I thought was that that just a, a lack of clear thinking about the way that cities should work, which is that, there's a fundamental job of Cape Town, which is to help its citizens get out of poverty, but they need to be smart about it. They need revenues to do that. Okay. And what are their revenues? Where do they come from? Well, fundamentally, they have power over land. They have power over property development. So I encourage them to think about their role as being a for-profit property developer that was fully owned by a not-for-profit poverty alleviation company. Right. And so let the for-profit property developer make as much money as they possibly can, right? Don't screw up the development downtown by thinking that you want to use that as being part of your poverty alleviation. It's a very expensive way to do it, right? The right thing to do is to get as much money out of the rich as you possibly can and funnel that money into the things that are known to help poor, you know, most notably education and health, things that are low cost, um, but things that are, are really shown to deliver results. So this is, I think, the right way to think about many city governments is you want to figure out where your revenues are coming from. You don't want to do things that screw up those revenues. And one thing that's really important is that post Zoom, talent has become more mobile than ever. That means in some sense, the global competition for talent has just heated up. That it's easy to imagine you know, relocating from San Francisco to Honolulu, or from London to down if you want, or from Johannesburg to uh, Sao Paulo. All of these things have just become much easier. And consequently, you really do want your for-profit arm to be thinking about how is it that we're gonna scoop up as much of the global rich and the global talented as possible so we can make money off of them. At the same time, once that money comes in, you want the poverty alleviation arm to think, well, what can I do to possibly make lives better for our poor and desperate citizens with this money that we're getting in. But just don't confuse the two functions. You know, there are two things, raising revenues and helping the poor, and you just don't want to muddle the two up. Great, thank you. Um, before I get to COVID, I had one further thought, but maybe you've covered it already, which was that you've said that making sure that the cities of the developing world really deliver is, in many ways, the, the great vacation of the 21st century. Is there anything else you want to add on that? Oh, I think if anything, I've come to believe that even, even more uh, over the time of COVID, right? I mean, there is there's no future in rural poverty, right? The, the world needs to get rich and that means the world needs to urbanize. But there are these huge challenges associated with urbanization and contagious disease is one of them. Um, I don't know what's going to happen with climate change, but, you know, every low lying city has at least some risk of waterborne, uh, waterborne trauma from this. But these are problems that will not go away on their own. These are problems that require people who are passionately committed to making the cities of the developing world healthier and stronger. That doesn't necessarily mean you need to join government. I've never you know, been a formal government official in my entire life, and I, I've tried to, to be of service in this area. This may mean that you're going to work for private enterprise. It may mean that you're going to become an entrepreneur that delivers a service that's valuable or that delivers something totally different, but then takes some sort of a philanthropic effort in making your city better. But there is just really profound need for um, improving the quality of governance in the world cities. And when governance fails, it is the poor who suffer most. And so there's really a tremendous moral need to fight for the world cities and to fight for the place of the poor in those cities. And to make sure, I'm going to take this back to where you started this conversation, that those voices that say, oh, you know, you, you know about cities, Professor Glazer, tell me how I stop the poor people from coming to my city and screwing it up, right? Which is a question that I've gotten from public leaders all the time. And that, that vision is just so wrong. Um, the, the goal is to make the city more welcoming not one in which insiders get to hold on to their urban benefits and, and close the, the 
doors on outsiders. So we really need to have sort of a, a holistic vision that embraces change, embraces urbanization, embraces people coming to cities, but then recognizes that that only becomes livable if our governments get better. And we need to do exactly what happened in the 19th century, which is to not, you know, focus on some, you know, theoretical improvement to democracy, but say, look, the problem is water, the problem is sewers, the problem is uh, policing. How is it that we can actually improve those basic functions and the institutional change will follow? Great. Let's come to the last one, which is the subject of your forthcoming book, which is the impact of the COVID pandemic on the future of cities. Um, your new book, Survival of the City, deals with this. You've already talked about the downsides of density and certainly educated me about the downsides of density in the past. And you've talked about how past plagues have destroyed urban civilizations. What are the prospects for urbanization in the world's great cities today? Thank you, Ed. So I, I don't think, I don't worry at all about, I mean, unless we had a plague that was far deadlier than COVID-19, I, I don't think that urban, that, you know, the pandemic will do much to derail urbanization in Johannesburg or Cape Town, uh, or you know, much of the developing world, um, in part because poor people are just not that worried about this disease, right? It is much less deadly than cholera was in the 19th century, and people kept flooding to cities in the 19th century despite the deaths from cholera and yellow fever that were just much higher. Um, there, the only real thing that we should worry about in terms of Cape Town and Johannesburg is will the rich people just try to escape using Zoom? That's the only thing that we worry about, not, not that the poor people will stop coming. Um, in the wealthy world, it's a little bit more worrisome, both because of the threat of pandemic and because of the increased ease of connecting uh, virtually. Um, I think there are two scenarios to think about. The one which is, you know, we end up having a fairly deadly thing that persists in cities, either because of this pandemic getting worse or because of a new pandemic within the next five years, that's gonna be a very hard world. Um, and uh, I you know, think that it's, it's a world that's not only difficult for cities, but you know, there are 30, in 2019, there were 32 million Americans, one fifth of the employed labor force that worked in, in the urban So um, one of the th things that we try to do in our book is to emphasize the need for, you know, uh, first order engagement by the wealthy cities of the world, uh, by the wealthy countries of the world in this. We are pushing an idea which we call NATO for health, with the idea that the WHO is just underpowered, does many good things, but, you know, it is far too democratic, it is far too large, it is far too sprawling, and what you really need is a small number of countries that dedicate significant resources, and, you know, I, we advocate this sort of global trade of a aid for sanitary investments in the developing world in exchange for better monitoring and better regulations, particularly that those that separate human beings from animals, um, which are a primary source of, of pandemics in the 21st century. Um, if you end up being in the better scenario, which is that maybe this thing goes on for another couple of years, but it's not all that deadly, um, we still have challenges to cities, right? We've still been through this experience where we've many people have learned to uh, find Zoom better. Um, and, you know, there's a live thought that this will actually lead towards a, towards a wholesale shift to telecommuting, that in fact, offices will become vacant, that cities will uh, consequently suffer enormously. Um, I think this depends a lot on what cities themselves do. So I don't think that the demand for face-to-face -face contact or urban life is in any danger whatsoever. OK, and there is plenty of evidence that even though cities work perfectly well for even though telecommuting works perfectly well for short term productivity. And there are some of these papers look at things like um, working in call centers. So apparently you can work as a call center worker perfectly well from home as you can from the office. But even those papers show less learning. So um, people are much less likely to be promoted 
when they're remote than when they're online, either because their employer isn't noticing how competent they are, so there's no learning from em employee to employer, or they as employees are not learning how to take the difficult calls. What you get promoted for as a call center worker is to being a person who actually handles the more difficult calls. And how would you learn that if you weren't around other call center workers? Similarly, the evidence that we have on computer programmers, Microsoft tells us that their programmers who had been hired before COVID were just as productive when they went home home. But overall, new hires for computer programmers were down 40% between November 2019 and November 2020, which suggests that companies were very wary about onboarding new workers. And I can tell you just as a teacher, there's just no comparison. I can work with existing, um, you know, co-authors perfectly well. But it, when it comes to getting 19-year-olds excited about mathematical economics, I have no idea how to do that uh, over Zoom. So um, just the learning function is, is much weaker. And at the same time, the, the fun function is much weaker. So I certainly noticed this about any of our of, of kids' schools that just, it was possible to sort of duplicate the pure pedagogic element, but it was very difficult to make it nearly as enjoyable. We as human beings, we work less well and we learn less well when we're finding it to be a, a, a drudge rather than finding it to be a pleasure. Um, so what does this mean going forward? I think a lot has to do with how, you know, cities will respond to this. So it is unquestionably a moment in which talent is more mobile than ever. Now, the danger is that American cities are often are also at a point in which there's a tremendous amount of progressive urge to try and fight social inequities. Those progressive urges have a lot to recommend them, right? There really is a problem in American policing that has been you know, far too disrespectful to people who are, are poor, people of color, does, has imprisoned far too low level of offenders, and we really need to reform policing. But if you defund the police, right, which is what some of them call for, you're going to risk going back to the crime waves of the 70s and 80s, right, and then talent is going to flee. There's a big urge to, you know, do more for inequality. Well, if that turns out into big urban taxes that tax the rich and give to the poor, at the local level, the rich are just going to leave. They're not going to put up with that. So, um, there are things that are real problems, particularly the U.S., the failure of U.S., schools to take the children of the poor and turn them into middle-class adults is certainly one of the biggest failings of our urban areas. Um, and we should be fighting on that just as we should be fighting to reform peace. But we need to do so in the recognition that the rich and the highly educated have never been more mobile than ever. And so it is crucial that cities focus on the property development side as well and are you know, focused on making sure that the talent still wants to stay rather than just thinking that they can you know, just view the rich as being a stationary peggy bank. And the larger point I think that makes is in some sense going into 2020, the cities of the wealthy world were much weaker than they were going into 2001 and the terrorist attacks on, on World Trade Center. Um, in 2001, cities had had a, like New York and Boston had had a 20 year renaissance. There was a fair amount of unanimity about the role for cities to be pragmatic, to recognize that talent and businesses weren't fixed. The last 20 years, cities have both done quite well economically, but increasing fissures have opened up. Those fissures, those divisions mean that civil society is much weaker in some sense than it was 20 years ago. And one of the things, I'm not gonna go through this history, I'll hand it back to you, but one of the things that we learned from the history of pandemics is that the impact of pandemics and other natural disasters is much larger when they meet a fractured society than when, than when they meet a society that is coherent. Well, sobering words for South Africa and very important words for South African cities, certainly. Um, Ed Glazer, thank you very much. This has been an absolutely fascinating hour. I hope everyone on this call now knows why CD are chairman of Ed's fan club in the southern part of the hemisphere. And uh, thank you very much. It's been a wonderful hour. And Ed, we really appreciate the time that you've given us and the wisdom. Absolutely my pleasure. Thank you all. And thank you especially, thank Anne. Thank you. Thanks very much, everybody. The Zoom is now closed. Thanks, Ed. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.